Today's program is part of the award-winning series, Profiles in Literature, featuring interviews with persons prominent in American literature for children. The moderator of this series is Dr. Jacqueline Schachter Weiss. Profiles in Literature welcomes Karen Cushman, 1996 Newbery Medal winner, and her clarion editor, Dinah Stevenson. Joining me is Carolyn Field, Coordinator Emerita of Children's Work for the Free Library of Philadelphia. Oh, thank you. And it's great being here with you, Karen and Dinah. And tell me, Karen, where do you live? I live in uh, Oakland, California, in the Bay Area, across the bay from San Francisco. Oh, that's nice. Mm -hmm. Now, we have here a picture of your backyard. Do you often relax in it? Uh, I did before I uh, started writing. Now I don't have nearly as much time as I did before, but I often go out to visit our cat, Delphinium, who never comes in the house and just waits for us to come into her territory. Ah. So we often sit at that table and enjoy the yard. Very good. And uh, this is a picture of your husband, Philip Cushman. Tell me, what does he do? He's a psychologist and for the last two years has been teaching full time at uh, California School of Professional Psychology, which is a graduate program in psychology in uh, the Bay Area. Very good. And now we have a picture of two other members of your family. Tell us about them. The older one is my mother, Loretta Lipsky, and uh, the younger one is my daughter, Leah, who is 23. Uh, she recently graduated from the University of California at Santa Cruz. Uh, she started as an art major and finished as a biology major. Wonderful. <laughs> Go figure that one. So what does she want to do? She's trying to figure that out. Right now oh. she's working at a bookstore because mm -hmm. she gets books, uh, you know, at uh, discount Discounts. rates and what more could she want right now. And uh, she's interested in science education, uh, in writing, in publishing, in, uh, in art, and trying to figure out how to put all those together. Well, she'll have a time. Yes. Well, you know, I'm a cat lover, uh -huh. and now here we have a picture of one of your cats. Now, introduce it to her. This is Lobelia, who is 16 years old, and uh, all her life has been obnoxious. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and you feed her? Uh, uh -huh. yeah, now we have a picture of a dog. Uh -huh. This and is our foster dog, Patrick. Uh, he really belongs to someone else, but we've been keeping him. It's now been four years. So What, uh, what unusual yeah. names, Lobelia yeah. and Patrick. Uh, Patrick w was named Patrick for the beer, uh, the, the saint, and Killian for the beer. And uh, Lobelia <laughs> is one of a long line of pets that we've had named after blue flowers: uh, liverwort, oh. pickleweed, delphinium, oh, Lobelia, <laughs> morning glory. Exciting. Yes. In what studies did you get your degrees? Uh, I uh, graduated from college in English and Greek. I started as an English major, but got very interested in the classics department, so I had a double major. And uh, a number of years after that, I got a degree in human behavior, which was a sort of an anthropology, sort of psychology degree. I was interested in people and you know how they behaved and how they were alike and how different. And um, my, la my second master's was in museum studies, uh, which was a degree for people who wanted to work in museums. I never, I got the degree and never worked in a museum. I went right into the department. Uh, working on the journal and then teaching. For the last 10 years I've been teaching in that department. So you're not a curator. That's right. We don't train curators at the school. Curators mostly come through subject matter uh, emphases, uh, art history or science or history. But we train museum educators, uh, collections managers, uh, administrators. In what school are you It's uh, John employed? F. Kennedy University in uh, the Bay Area in Orinda, California. And what was your first published book for young people? Catherine Called Birdie was my first book. Uh, I wrote a lot as a child, but uh, gave it up for a number of years and did other things. And uh, kept having these great ideas uh, for stories. And I would tell my husband, I have this great idea. And I'd tell him, and, and nothing would happen. So once about five years ago, I said, listen to this. I have a great idea for a story. And he said, I refuse to listen. Oh. He said, you've been saying that for 25 years, and every uh -huh. time you say it out loud, then you don't do anything more about it. He said, I'll listen if you'll read it to me. He said, so write it down and then read it to me. So I said, well, I'll show him. Uh -oh. And I went, and I wrote down the first seven pages, and I read it to him. And uh, so now I use that as a metaphor when I go to school. 
uh, MIC, Wonderful. Mm -hmm. um, that it's not enough to have an idea, even a good idea. You have to take a stand, make a commitment, mm -hmm. take action, write it down. I stole mm -hmm. it from him. You know. I but, think, as a psychologist, uh -huh. he used excellent psychology well, I do, too. He's been you. doing that all our married life. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> uh. um, I'd like to know what you consider the main source of humor in Catherine Colberti. Well, I, I suppose the main source of humor is me. You know, <laughs> since I was writing it, and she sounds a bit like me, she's a little, uh, a bit of a wise guy. Uh, but what uh, the reason, one of the reasons I picked the diary format was that I liked the opportunity it gave us to see. Catherine and her world through her eyes as well as our own eyes and that the difference between those two and uh, uh, how one commented on the other was uh, one of the main sources of humor to me. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. I was, uh, I loved the Adrian Mole diary books and I thought that that worked so well in that case that uh, for us to get to know someone from a time and place so different uh, it would work well uh, in that, in this book too mm -hmm. so I did that. Why did you decide to focus on the medieval period? Well, there were a lot of reasons. I was interested in um, medieval life avocationally, music and Renaissance fairs and, uh, and unicorn tapestries. Um, but I also was thinking about children in uh, times past. And um, when I got the idea for a story about a girl who didn't have many options or choices and really only had herself, to, that she was in, in charge of, I thought how much more true that would be at a time like the Middle Ages when children didn't ha had less power and less value than they do now. Uh, and so that her options were even more limited and her choices. And so what could she do about that? And it seemed that the setting and the situation really came together, which I think is one of the most important aspects of historical fiction, mm -hmm. when those two come together like that. And part of the humor was her one-upmanship on her father yes, whenever yes, she could. Yes. Um, why is it that you never found any medieval items that belonged to children? I think that's a good question. I don't know if they weren't saved, if uh, what children had or used or wore was passed down so often that it just uh, uh, was used up. Uh, it's the same with writing. We don't have any first-person writing <coughs> excuse me, by children. We have diaries and journals from other people, but we really don't have letters or mm -hmm. um, anything from children. So um, I think that's one reason. Another reason is that very, we have very little from the, from the Middle Ages. We have what belonged to people who are important enough to have their um, items saved. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I think that few children were that important. Isn't it also true that children didn't have many possessions in the Middle Ages, mm -hmm. unlike I children that's today? Very true. Oh, that's very yeah. True. Mm -hmm. yeah, books or toys mm -hmm. or any of the things mm -hmm. that we associate with childhood. They in do the have period. some toys, and they're fascinating to see that the, the form of the toys hasn't changed. Leather balls mm -hmm. and um, the uh, dancing dolls on sticks, and the, and they, so one of the museums has these two knights. Oh yes, yeah. mm -hmm. mm -hmm. mm -hmm. constant mm -hmm. warfare. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I wanted to tell you that uh, Catherine Colberti is based on a diary written in England in the year 1290, beginning in the year 1290. Um, it sent many of us scurrying for old English dictionaries mm -hmm. to look up terms like gittern, which is an early guitar, timbrel, a tambourine, wimple, a nun's mm -hmm. headdress, and girdle, a woman's mm -hmm. gown. Did I make any errors in my synonyms? Kirtle. 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 Mm -hmm. K-I-R-T-L. Kirtle. 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 Mm -hmm. Kirtle. And the wimple, which we now associate with nuns, was worn by all married women at that time. Oh, I see. They say if you want to know what uh, women in the Middle Ages wore, look at the traditional nun's garb, uh -huh. because that's oh. what all women uh, uh -huh. married or of a certain age wore. And the nun mm -hmm. has retained that traditional garb, and we, of course, have Some do. changed. Yes, well, that's, now things have that's really interesting. changed. Uh -huh. uh, I would like to compare the cover designs for the hardback of Catherine called Birdie. Uh, it's on the left. And on the right is the softback cover of uh, Catherine. The one on the left is done by the artist Trina Shard Hyman. It shows a 14-year-old girl writing in her diary 
in her bedroom with caged birds. On the right is a somewhat less authentic uh, girl in terms of attire and headdress, but with a great sense of humor because this damsel is about to cause a bucket of water to be poured on her would-be suitor. How do you react, Karen first and then Dinah, to the covers? When I first got to Trina's cover, I looked at it and I thought, this is not what I anticipated at all. I somehow thought the book was much more lighthearted and that it was the humorous aspect that would be emphasized. But after, I mean, but it's so beautiful that I couldn't help but love it. Mm -hmm. It just seemed a little bit darker than what I thought the book was like. After living with it, she became Birdie to me. And now when I think of her in my mind, this is exactly what she looks like. I love how authentic uh, the, uh, her garb is and her room, how dark her room is and how light mm -hmm. the outside is. I think that's wonderful. I understand the marketing needs that uh, drove the uh, paperback house to uh, change the cover to make it more humorous and more mm -hmm. lighthearted, but I think that the original will always be Catherine to me. Mm -hmm. How do you react? Well, my, uh, my first response to uh, Trina Hyman's artwork for Catherine called Birdie was yes, mm -hmm. because it seemed to me to capture the full emotional mm -hmm. range of the book, both the characters. Uh, light and dark sides, strong-mindedness, beauty. Um, mm -hmm. And it makes perfect sense to me that the paperback should have a different cover mm -hmm. sure, mm -hmm. because they're two different editions uh -huh. uh, aiming at essentially two different pieces of the audience. Um, I don't have the same heart feeling for it that I do for, mm -hmm. uh, for okay. Trina's jacket, but of course it would have to be different sure. because it's a different book. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, Karen, uh, have you received any uh, fan mail recently that you, you could share with us? Uh, I receive a lot of fan mail, both after I do a school visit and uh, a mail that's sent to the publisher and forwarded to me. And what I think is so interesting is uh, not only what they say, but how many of the letters are illuminated, that they're inspired by the medieval uh, mm -hmm. uh, situations and background of the book to do illuminated letters. Uh, some of them are, are quick and are obviously uh, school uh, requirements, and some of them really um, <clears throat> seem to come from the heart and uh, reveal the writer behind them. This one says, Dear Mrs. Karen Cushman, from the greatest ideas of inspirations that come from my heart, I would like to thank you. You seem to be extremely elaborate with your devotion and love for writing. One day I hope to walk in your footsteps as a writer. <laughs> oh Sounds like my. she's already practicing. Mm -hmm. Yes, it does. Uh, Catherine Calverti is a book that I just love. And it received in 1995 the uh, silver Newbery Honor Medal. Right. And then in 1996, you, re you received mm -hmm. the gold Honor Medal yes, for The Midwife's Apprentice. Uh -huh. That is fantastic two great honors in a I row. suppose I didn't know enough to know it couldn't be done, so. <laughs> Fine. I went into Fine. it. Fine. Yeah. Uh, we are showing the Newberry Medal, and I wanted to uh, tell you that Catherine Calberti is a nobleman's daughter, shown in her 14th and 15th year. She's very different from the heroine of your next mm -hmm. medieval hardback, The Midwife's Apprentice. Again, we see Trina Shard Hyman's drawing on the cover showing Brat, who renames herself Alice. She is about 12 or 13 years old. Alice is a homeless orphan who sleeps on a dung heap and eats stale bread that's in payment for her services to a midwife. Why did you write, Karen, uh, The uh, Midwife's Apprentice? I had for a long time thought about the title, The Midwife's Apprentice, and it appealed to me, and I kind of carried it around with me everywhere. And, um, after I sent Bertie out, I sat down to write it, and I had no idea what the story was going to be about or what it had to do with me. 
uh, I just knew that there was a story inside of me about a midwife's apprentice, and it was when I got the image of her coming out of the dung heap, almost like she was being born. This person with no name, with no background, we know nothing about her parents or, or what town this is, that she's brand new, newly born. And uh, I think I wanted to know what happened to her also, that I wanted to see her, her grow and become a real person with a full belly and a place in this world. And in a peculiar way, although I've never had uh, an empty belly and I've never been homeless, um, I felt a lot like this girl, looking for a place to belong. And, and, I, and I thought that this was kind of a universal condition, that we're mm -hmm. all born homeless and nameless, and that we spend a lot of our lives looking for a place to belong. And I wanted to tell that story. I like her basic ideas the full belly, mm -hmm. a contented heart, yes. uh -huh. and a place in yes. this world. Dinah, I know that you were overjoyed <laughs> with both books winning in the children's category. Oh, absolutely. But I point out that in Catherine Called Birdie, in the last part of the book, Catherine is 15, mm -hmm. a young adult age. And in the midwife's apprentice, the topic of childbirth is raised, and that's considered more of a young adult topic at times mm -hmm. than a child topic. Weren't you pleasantly surprised when both won in the children's category? You know, it didn't occur to me to be uh, surprised <laughs> about that. Uh, I had no question in my mind that these were books for young people. Um, that would be enjoyed and appreciated by really anybody who could decipher the words. Mm -hmm. um, yes, of course I'm overjoyed that they won in the children's category. Um, we, uh, Clarion books could not be more overjoyed altogether at the success that these books are having. You dedicated The Midwife's Apprentice mm -hmm. To your husband and editor, yes, I did. Mm -hmm. Philip and Dinah, mm -hmm. Alice's midwives. That's right. Does your husband <laughs> always critique your manuscripts? Well, he certainly would like to. <laughs> <laughs> and sometimes I let him. He's very important to me that he's always the first person who's not me who sees this. I think he would like to know more. I think he'd be happy if I'd sit every night and tell him exactly what I wrote during that day and everything about it. But it's I can't do that. Uh, but when I do need somebody to read it, and to read it uh, as a reader and not as an editor, mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. though he'll do both. If I put a pencil in his hand, he's an editor. If I take it away, I say, just read it and tell me the feeling. He does that. But he's very important to me, and he listens. And um, uh, uh, his feedback uh, is very helpful to me. Sure is. And we thank mm -hmm. you, Philip, wherever <laughs> you are, <laughs> having a good time today mm -hmm. in New York. <laughs> uh, but I now <laughs> want you to tell mm -hmm. me how essential the role was that Dinah played with both of your books. Well, I can start with The Midwife. I don't think it would have taken the shape that it did if it weren't for Dinah. I wrote the first half, and it just poured out of me. Uh, and sent it in, and uh, people loved it. And then I sat down with all of this praise to do the second half. and. Uh, I had Alice going off on almost a picaresque adventure, and it did not feel right. And I rewrote it and rewrote it and rewrote it, and I couldn't come up with what was wrong. And that's where an editor is really valuable. And I sent it to Dine. I said, I don't know if this is a book or a writing exercise, first of all, and I can't get, I don't think this ending is right. What's wrong with it? And she was able to we talked back and forth and sent things back and forth. She's never said, do it this way or, or take this out and put this in. But as we talked, it occurred to me that Alice really needed to come full circle, to go back where she started to uh -huh. uh, succeed, where she had uh -huh. failed, to stay in that same small place. And I think that that's where a really good editor um, does her best work, is where she pulls it out of you and helps uh -huh. you uh -huh. develop it rather than saying, you know, with a blue pencil, take this out and add this. And I, that's why I dedicated it to her. I she see. was really important to my giving birth to this book. And uh -huh. it's your turn now, Dinah. Yes. Uh, I think the public underappreciates the role of executive editors like yourself. Mm -hmm. I do know that for 25 years, 
you've been an editor with established houses. Mm -hmm. What more can you tell us about your background? Well, I don't really have any background that specifically prepared me for this work. My academic work, both uh, undergraduate and graduate, was in English literature, which I think gave me good training in reading texts closely and taking literature seriously as a, as a life work. Um, aside from that, I think having been a child and having <laughs> been a child who was a reader um, turned out to be very good preparation mm -hmm. for being an editor who is still somewhere inside a child reader. That's mm -hmm. one, of the, one of the things that I have to be in the course of my professional efforts. And editing does require a great deal of breadth in many, many areas, which you must bring to the task. Well, mm -hmm. it, it's interesting. I have uh, a colleague who uh, often says that if you gave the same manuscript to five editors, you would come out with five different books. I think I that's see. true. I'm sure of that. I see. And that's mm -hmm. why I'm Positive. so lucky to have done yes, because are. I came <laughs> out with the books that I did. That won. Mm -hmm. That won. Dinah, in what way has your working relationship with Karen been unique? You've worked with many other people. In what way has your work been unique, um, the two of you? Well, let's, let me see. That's a very interesting question. Um, this is the only um, writer with whom I've worked who has won um, a Newbery Honor at the Newbery Medal. I think that's, uh, that's, that's definitely different. unique. Mm -hmm. Um, I hope I'm not presuming if I say I think we, we have quickly developed um, a mutual trust and understanding which enables mm -hmm. us to at some point speak in shorthand to each other, um, which is helpful since we live 3,000 miles mm -hmm. apart and can't actually sit down with a piece of paper between us. That's true. Oh. I didn't think of that. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I just need to hear her voice. I'll say, I can't. Oh, I, ne I just thought of it. Never mind. No. <laughs> oh, or, my. I can't remember. Oh, yeah. Oh, uh -huh. my. That's uh -huh. magnetism, uh -huh. isn't it? Uh -huh. Well, Karen, aside mm -hmm. from uh, uh, emphasizing uh, females and, and uh, the poor and uh, authority, what were uh, one or two attitudinal differences in the Middle Ages from today? Oh, I think that's very important, and I emphasize that when I talk to kids, that mm -hmm. these are not just us in different clothes eating eel pie <laughs> and drinking ale for breakfast, that there were very real differences in what they believed and what they thought important in, in expectations. For example, uh, uh, children asked me, why was her father so mean that he'd marry Catherine off to uh, someone she didn't want to marry? Mm -hmm. And I said, it's not because he was mean, it's because that was what was expected of a young noble girl at that time, that her marriage was not for romance, but to further the family's fortunes or um, uh, power or to uh, gain noble relations or land. And that was expected. Catherine is the one who is working against expectations. And it's the same with the, the bear baiting or the public executions, that these were not strange uh, amusements. These were very um, common amusements. And people would take picnic lunches and sit around and watch somebody be hung. Uh, and that's um, something we have to understand about this culture in order to understand the book. They mm -hmm. say, we used dirty yeah. words. I say, I didn't. I used words that were the common words for bodily functions at that time. And if mm -hmm. I were to change all of this, I would be telling a different story. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, uh, Carolyn, I wonder if you could pursue some questions about her third book. Because... Uh, uh, that's what I'd like to talk about. All right. Because okay. I've read... Uh, uh, a manuscript copy, mm -hmm. which I loved it, the the ballad of Lucy Whipple. That's right. And and the two of you again worked uh -huh. on this book. That's right. Well, uh, one of the interesting things about it is that it's a, again a female mm -hmm. protagonist mm -hmm. who uh, is brought to California mm -hmm. during the period of the gold rush. Right. So this is quite different from your middle ages uh, right. type of thing. And uh, Lucy. Uh, is homesick. She wants to go back to Massachusetts uh, to live with her grandparents. Uh, I understand that you were taught, uh, brought to uh, yes. California too. Yes. Uh, where did you come from? I was born and raised in a, a suburb of Chicago and when I was 10 we moved to California. And um, Since I said 
something ab about that uh, in another interview. Interview. My mother has gotten very worried. Did I really not want to come? She didn't know that. I never told. Oh, I, I, I love it. I was ten years old <laughs> then, and now I'm a writer, and I make yeah. things up. You know. Uh, but I think that in a way I am playing out that move where I had to leave my dog and I had to leave my grandparents and mm -hmm. my public library. Mm -hmm. I brought home my ten books mm -hmm. uh, every week uh, and uh, I think that's a good thing about writing that I can play out all of those um, situations and events in my past life and maybe do it better. Well, what, what, what did your parents do? What was the occupation of your father and your mother? Uh, my father at that time was a salesman and uh, my mother uh, was an accountant, or, but she hadn't worked since I was born. And we moved to California, and the job that my father came for fell through. So there we were. They had two kids. I was 10, and my brother was 7 in California, and neither one of them had a job. So they had a lot of scrambling to do mm -hmm. uh, to find work. And um, we lived in the San Fernando Valley uh, outside, of, uh, outside of Los Angeles. And it was quite different. I remember the first. Uh, Thanksgiving, we ate Thanksgiving dinner at the picnic table outside in our shorts yeah. oh. and took home movies that they sent back uh, to all of their relatives in uh, Chicago thinking that they would be very jealous. And I remember thinking, how can we do this? You've got to have <laughs> snow and sleighs and, and, uh, and pumpkins with frost on them for Thanksgiving. <laughs> but uh, it worked. Worked. Mm -hmm. uh, do, do you have any brothers or sisters? I have a younger brother named yeah. uh, Arthur do? Jr. or Duffy. We always called him. He mm -hmm. um, was an executive for the telephone company for many years, and the first time they gave people an opportunity to retire, he grabbed it, and they moved to Tucson, where he got a doctorate in nutrition and does nutritional counseling. Oh, interesting. that's interesting. Yes. yes. Uh, well, have you have any idea where you're going to set your next book? The one that I'm working on now is back in the Middle Ages uh, and is set in the medical quarter of a medieval town. I got very interested in, while I was researching the other books in blood letters and bone setters and leeches and barber surgeons. Oh. And I thought it would be gross enough for me, yeah, and the yeah. average seventh grader, to get involved with that next. So it's that's also mm -hmm. a topic no one else has touched. Yes. Mm -hmm. The whole medieval period. Yes. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, as a librarian, I was very pleased with uh, Lucy Whipple's. Uh, <laughs> decision to become uh -huh. a librarian uh -huh. and did, did you, you make up the ballad of rattlesnake Jake? Jake? Yes, I did. You did? I did. Oh, it's yeah. wonderful. It just sounds as though it came <laughs> from that period. I, I, I read a great. lot of ballads until the rhythms were in my head and then I did it. I'm so sorry. I'm going to have to say thank you to our splendid author and yeah. editor. Now that you've released your creative powers, Carol, we look forward to an onrushing of work from your heart to the hearts of your eager readers. Thank you. I know that Dinah Stevenson will help pave the way. It's been good getting to know you. Thank Just you. sorry we didn't have more time. La 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 la